Good evening, everybody. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I especially want to thank, I have a phenomenal group of interns over here who have been greeting you, and my legislative aide, Paul Fahey, and Laura Booth, who's helped me organize these, uh, this series. Some of you were able to attend the one we had two weeks ago on immigration and civil liberties. Um, we were expecting about 40 people. We had over 130 people attend. And the idea behind the series in November, um, I met with Lord and a number of folks from Cambridge to say, how are we going to deal with the fact that this guy has been elected and, and does not represent the values that we hold true here in Cambridge? And we decided that we probably needed to create a space um, where we could bring our Cambridge community together to have conversations about issues that are affecting us at the, the national level, what it looks like at the state level, and what we get to do here at the local level. We should have known and predicted this, but we didn't, on how important that having this space would be. So quickly, I guess, that was the thing. We didn't realize how quickly it was going to be needed. We've also found that this is happening all over the country, all over the state, and all over Cambridge. I am looking at people who I saw last night at an event, I saw at 8 a.m. this morning at an event, some of you then at 11 a.m., and it's been gatherings of you know, over 50 people where I walk into the room and I realize that I don't know half the people who are showing up. I was not here for the Democratic City Committee meeting and um, it was during school vacation, right? So I w was not expecting the highest turnout. It was packed. And, and I think what we're finding is that two things. People are really hungry and anxious for the opportunity to connect with each other, to connect with people that they trust at some level are some shared values. Um, the values where we actually include people and not harm people, and the opportunity to connect with accurate information. A and so what I have been saying the last couple of days, and, and I'll say again, is that I think the two things I have been finding to be true is I think it's really important that we understand um, tuning out and burning out, for me, are both forms of privilege, right? And, and finding that balance, because this week alone, there are several events like this happening. and so it would be very easy to show up at all five or six events. And some of us can do that, but most probably can't sustain that, right? So burning out is a form of privilege, but tuning out is as well. So finding that balance for all of us is something that I, I just keep encouraging myself and, and all of you to do. I want to say um, a very special hello and great to see you. And I got to see you twice today is uh, Representative Alice Wolf, who is here with us. I think many of the things that we're looking on holding on to were things that she was very pivotal and actually helping us to achieve here locally. <laughs> um, I also saw our, our vice mayor, um, Mark McGovern, who was here with us, and there may be some other electeds walking in. Um, the great thing about Cambridge is there's so many incredible people who are sitting right here who every day spend um, their life working to figure out how to make our community and our country and our communities kinder, stronger, and healthier, and more just. And I would like to say, um, I'm just going to jump right into this, because I want to introduce two incredible people, people that I am, um, I, I really admire their work, and I admire their tenacity. Um, and I want to thank them both for being here with us today. To my left, we have someone who has very strong Cambridge ties. So that's one of the things that really makes him special, in addition to all of his credentials. Um, John McDonough, that last name McDonough might sound familiar to some of you. Um, he, Jerry McDonough, from some of you who know, um, is, is the brother of John McDonough, who's an incredible organizer here. Um, and we, we have a sister-in-law, Marianne Hart, who's also an incredible advocate on health care. Um, I first came to know John McDonough and to be really in awe of him when I was a legislative aide over 20 years ago. And he had a legislative aide. Some of you might have heard of her. Her name's Representative Liz Malia of Jamaica Plain. Um, and we were aides together. and. Um, John was the chair of healthcare at the time when people were not talking about how to expand access to healthcare, um, but John was. And I remember thinking how amazing it was to see somebody in this position as an elected official working on healthcare. And I also knew that he was working on his PhD, and I was really inspired by that. And I don't think I've ever said that to him. Um, and he has gone on to have an incredibly important role in, um, that has impact us, impacted us nationally, nationally on expanding access to health care for all. So John McDonough is a, um, he's a doctor 
P.H. Well, they just gave me this. I'm going to read this. It may not sound so right reading it. Dr. P.H. MPA, Professor of Public Health Practice in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Harvard T.H. Chang School of Public Health and Director of the HSPH Center for Executive and Continuing Professional Education. Between 2008 to 2010, he served as a senior advisor on the National Health Reform to the U.S. Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, where he worked on the development and the passage of the ACA. Thank you. He served, yeah. <laughs> He served as the director from Massachusetts' leading health advocacy organization, Healthcare from All, for All, from 2003 to 2008, where he played a key role in the passage and implementation of the 2006 Massachusetts Health Reform Law. John McDonough received a doctorate in public health in 1996 from the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan and a master's in public administration from the JFK School of Government in 1990. From 1985 to 1987, he served as a member of the House of Representatives, where he was the chair of the Joint Committee on Health Care. Yeah, I thought that was strange. Thank you. 1997. And he has incredible attention to detail. Um, thank you. And I'm going to also at this take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Jennifer Childs Roshak. Um, who has been at Planned Parenthood, the, at the helm of Planned Parenthood in Massachusetts for 14 months. <laughs> um, and we are really excited. <laughs> I, I can tell you, um, I, I met uh, her when she first arrived on the scene and was brought around to the legislators to, to get to know and really was immediately very excited to learn more about her background and to know um, I think we knew then how important it was to have somebody at the helm of Planned Parenthood, but somebody with her experience um, and leadership has been, um, the timing could not be more critical or important. Um, so thank you for taking this role on at probably one of the most critical moments in our history. Dr. Childs Roshak leads the largest freestanding reproductive health care, is the le leading health care provider and advocate in the Commonwealth. Planned Parenthood League of Massachusetts provides a wide range of sexual and reproductive health care to more than 30,000 patients across the state and educates 9,000 people through, uh, through nationally recognized self self sexual health education programs. Prior to joining Planned Parenthood of Massachusetts, Dr. Childs Roshak has served as the Boston Regional Medical Director for Atrius Health while personally caring for 1,000 patients as a primary care physician. Yeah. Dr. Childs Roshak's interest in sexual and reproductive health care dates back to her time as a new Harvard graduate working as an editor at the United Nations Fund for Populations Activities, as well as volunteering with Planned Parenthood in New York City. Dr. Childs Roshak earned her medical degree from Temple University in Philadelphia and, has compl and completed her internship and residency at the Maine Medical Center in Portland and is board certified in family medicine. And, and I can tell you, um, she is exactly the kind of ambassador who I think um, legislators from lots of different places politically um, need to meet. Um, she has a way about her that is very um, comforting and also provides an incredible sense of confidence in the work that they do and the importance of that work. So I want to thank both of you for being here today. And I'm going to turn the mic over to the two of you. And we're going to have some time where each of them are going to be able to lay out a framework of what's happening with health care and access to health care at the national level. How does it impact us here in Massachusetts? What are the challenges for us at the local and the state level, as well as the national level? Where can we go from here? Um, and then we'll have some time for some question and answers. And then for me, one of the most critical moments of this night has been also to then ask all of you, once we're done with this part, to turn to each other. And we'll have some guiding questions, because I really think our best tools and our, our best ability to challenge the um, these policies of, of, of exclusion and harm are really to turn to each other and see the value and the resources that we bring to each other in our communities. Thank you. Would you like to start? Sure. OK, uh, good evening, everybody. Nice to be here with you. And thanks for coming out. And uh, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, has never been so popular <laughs> as in the past two months. Honestly, um, as uh, someone who's been paying, well, it's probably three or four months now. Um, so, um, and, uh, and we're also at a period of great danger and high uncertainty. Uh, anyone who tells you they know what's going to happen 
is kidding because no one can game this out. There are just too many variables at play, which is why people paying close attention to what's going on is highly important and highly valuable. Uh, this storyline changes day to day. Sometimes it changes hour to hour. There's things going on every day. It's um, kind of addictive to stay on top of it and, uh, and it can also be overwhelming. So let me just try to make a, a, a few points and then what I really like is, is opening it up in the conversation and the questions because I know everybody's got a lot on your mind to say. So we've gone from um, prior to November 8th, the Republican mantra was repeal and replace. And they really never thought they were going to get to that place. They really believed that Democrats would win the White House and probably the Senate and it would not be real. And then we all woke up on November 9th and it was real all of a sudden. Uh, so then they recognized that repeal and replace wouldn't make sense because they really weren't ready to replace. And so their mantra in November and December became repeal and delay. We would repeal it right away and then come up with a plan to replace it over the course of several years. Uh, people repeatedly indicated how that was a really irresponsible and faulty strategy. And so then in January it switched to we're going to repeal and replace instantly. Uh, within the same hour we would do two. We would repeal and replace on the same day in the same time. I think people uh, gradually understand that that also is unlikely because of the legislative procedural rules around regular legislation versus budget reconciliation. So now we've kind of moved into a new space where it's repeal and repair, repeal and rebuild, repeal and re-whatever. Uh, we just don't know. But I would say that the, the, the statement that is the most, ring, bears the most truth on its own level is what we heard from the president two days ago, which is just nobody knew how complicated this stuff was, okay? So what's, what's not true is, no, people did know how complicated this stuff was. It was just you, who is the world champion Olympic triathlete of projection, um, that everything that he recognizes must be true for everybody else. But it is true that this is really complicated stuff. And not just the president, but many, many people in the party are really coming to grips with how complicated it's, it was. On uh, November 9th, the day of the, uh, after the election, uh, the House Speaker, Paul Ryan, who is really the intellectual dr driving force behind the uh, repeal Obamacare movement, far more than, uh, than President Trump, uh, threw five balls up in the air in terms of what he was out to achieve. Uh, ball number one deals with all of the private coverage, private health insurance provisions of the Affordable Care Act, the guaranteed issue, no pre-existing conditions, the individual mandate, the subsidies to allow people to buy more affordable coverage, the health insurance exchanges here in Massachusetts thought called the connector. That was one ball thrown up in the air. We're going to get rid of most of that. A ball number two uh, is the Medicaid <coughs> ball and in particular repealing the expansion of Medicaid to low-income Americans in the ACA and also going beyond and fundamentally changing the financing structure of Medicaid so that it would no longer be an entitlement and it would be much easier to shrink and reduce the benefits and in particular the federal money going into the program. This is ball number two. Ball number three are the package in the ACA of the tax increases to pay for the coverage expansions under ball number one and ball number two, okay? Ball number four is Medicare. Uh, Paul Ryan also would like to fundamentally change Medicare to turn it into a system based on premium support, again, where the entitlement shrinks and people are more and more responsible for paying more for Medicare than they currently already do. And, uh, and there's a fundamental change then in the federal obligation to that program. And then the fifth ball thrown up in the year was changing fundamentally the tax treatment of employer-sponsored health insurance, which is the largest tax deduction in the federal tax code 
and, um, and there's been a desire on the part of Ryan and others to shrink and limit that tax deductibility for a long time. So that was November 9th. Today we look back at those five balls in the air. Ball number five, uh, changing the tax treatment of health insurance. Ryan talks about it. It's uh, central to the House plan and it's going nowhere fast. It's pretty much, uh, it's, it's lost all its air. It's a flat tire right now. Uh, ball number four, uh, fundamental changes to Medicare are also very much off the table. Not only is uh, President Trump uninterested, more importantly, the Senate has absolutely no interest in going there. So you listen to Paul Ryan, but keep your eye on what's being said over in the Senate. And so right away, so of the five balls, two are gone. The third ball um, that is in jeopardy right now is the Medicaid ball, uh, in particular because the people in the country who have the greatest political oomph outside of Congress when it comes to Medicaid are governors. And the Republican governors, there's 33 of them, 16 of them represent states that have expanded Medicaid under the ACA. They want no retrenchment in terms of that expansion in their own population. Folks like Rick Snyder, the governor of Michigan, John Kasich from Ohio, Susanna Martinez from Mexico. So they don't want, and meanwhile, the governors that have not expanded Medicaid, if they go to some different formula, they want all the money that they would have gotten had they expanded Medicaid or they won't support. And so, as predicted, the governors are really uh, divided. Uh, but the one thing that every governor sitting in the room at the National Governors Association, when all 50 are, they're always looking around at everybody else because they want to make sure that nobody, nobody is going to get a deal better than their deal, okay? So the only way to satisfy the governors is not just to hold everybody harmless, but everybody has to come out of there feeling like a winner. And pretty soon, there's not a lot of money to be saved from it. So the, the Medicaid ball is losing air fast, okay? And so it leads us down to two balls that are in the air, the private coverage expansions and the tax increases. One of the most important things in the ACA that people don't appreciate are the tax increases. In particular, one tax increase, the biggest tax increase in the ACA is new Medicare payroll taxes on high income families. So if you are a family, if you're a single adult and you have an income of over 200,000, or if you're a family and you have an annual income of over 250,000, beginning in 2013, there were new taxes on you, 0.9% on earned income, meaning what you get in your paycheck, and 3.9% on unearned income. And the 3.9% is, to, to Democrats, it's like unimaginable that they could achieve it. It's like the holy grail of tax policy, and it was achieved in the ACA because there were no Republicans who voted for it. And to Republicans, it is, I guess, forgive the Catholic version, it is the highest form of a mortal sin someone can commit. And so it is an absolute, so if you wonder why, for example, the Koch brothers are so interested in investing millions and millions of dollars in financing the opposition to the ACA. You will always, when you look at the Koch brothers, and I've read two books on them now, you will always find a breadcrumb trail to their own self-interest. And their own self-interest in the ACA represents the Medicare payroll taxes on unearned income, which if it is eliminated and every Republican plan eliminates it, it would represent one of the largest tax cuts on wealthy households in the history of the country. So it makes it a two for repeal Obamacare and accomplish a major tax cut on high income families. This part of the ACA has done probably more to change the direction of the income redistribution going in the wrong direction. So, so those two balls are very much in the air. Uh, you probably, some of you heard the president last night put out that Obamacare is a disaster, it's falling apart, and we have to repeal it. Um, 
Obamacare is actually working and achieving enormous gains. We have about 22 million Americans who've gotten coverage because of the law. Uh, we have tens of millions of Americans who are protected because of the elimination of pre-existing conditions and medical underwriting. Uh, there are count, uh, a large number of preventive health benefits that people are getting with no cost sharing. The rate of growth in the Medicare program over the first half of this decade was the lowest rate of growth since the program came into existence in 1966. So there are many, many important accomplishments and achievements. Many of them are deeply at risk right now in terms of uh, what's going on. And so this bears a lot of close watching and paying attention to. There are no elected officials, federal elected officials in Massachusetts who are supporting the Republican agenda. So if you have relations and contacts with people outside of Massachusetts who live in states with Republican senators in particular or members of Congress, um, beseech them to weigh in and raise their voices on it is probably the most important thing. There is a lot at stake in Massachusetts, just to close. Um, some people say, well, if the ACA is repealed, we just go back to what we had prior to the ACA through the 2006 Massachusetts Health Reform Law. That's unfortunately not correct. A lot of it was changed to conform with the ACA, and so it's not like the old statute just takes effect Obviously, there's a lot of support in the legislature, the House and the Senate, to keep this structure together. The governor, Charlie Baker, is publicly in support as well. But understand that Massachusetts reform only happened because there was an enormous amount of federal money that was embedded in the structure that was implemented in 2007. And all of that is at risk as well. So the notion that we can feel certain and safe in Massachusetts regardless of the best intentions of our elected officials is not really true because there is so much federal money embedded in this system and that is all at risk as well. And so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, John. Feel better? <laughs> We're going to get there. I'm going to turn this right over to you. Okay. Thanks. Oh, you want the mic too, sure, Jen? Why not? <laughs> Not sure I can project without it. Um, so thank you so much, um, Marjorie, um, Representative Decker, for having me. And, and John, it's great to share the stage. So I think I'm the color commentary um, person. You're definitely, you've got the details on the ACA. But I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I, I want to just add to John's uh, comments. I think there is a sixth ball, and that football is called Planned Parenthood. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but the other thing I just wanted to add to John's comments, and this is sort of the color commentary part, you know, is as a primary care physician for over 20 years, I have seen huge differences in access to care, in, um, in patients, people being able to um, prevent significant illnesses, um, reduce their overall cost of care significantly over the last several years. And, um, you know, I think that is a really important thing. It's thing I think about every day and what we think about certainly at Planned Parenthood is what's the impact for the individual patient? And it's, it's really significant and it's, it's huge. So, um, you know, I do appreciate though the, uh, I did not really fully understand ball number two and the tax cut. I think that that's actually really worth um, talking about, especially for a lot of the Trump voters who did feel left behind because that's not gonna help them at all. So I do want to start off, um, and I, I, I'm going to keep my remarks um, hopefully fairly succinct because I, I love the back and forth um, a little bit more. But I want to just take one little step back, if, you will, if you'll indulge me, and just very briefly talk about Planned Parenthood. Because what I have found in my 14 months is that even people who are supportive of Planned Parenthood don't really know exactly what we do. So um, I just want to quickly uh, frame who we are, what we do. So Planned Parenthood League of Massachusetts is one of 56 affiliates across the country. And that's down from over 150 affiliates just a handful of years ago. So it gives you a sense of what's happened nationally. We have always been one affiliate here in Massachusetts and uh, one affiliate for one state. There are other states that have multiple affiliates in one state, New York and California. 
and there are other states that share an affiliate. So for example, in the middle of the country, there are um, Kansas and Oklahoma, and there's a bunch of states that, that are in one affiliate. So it's really, um, it really varies. We have two, uh, two organizations under the umbrella of Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood League of Massachusetts, which is our healthcare, education, and advocacy organization, and the Planned Parenthood Advocacy Fund of Massachusetts. And that is our advocacy and electoral work. And so sometimes it's, it's I'm, I'm head of both, so I do need to keep my hat straight. But it is sometimes a little confusing to people when they see us up lobbying or they see us um, talking about supporting candidates. Um, it sometimes is a little bit confusing. But there are two organizations, and mostly what we're talking about with the ACA is, of course, the healthcare, uh, delivery of healthcare services. One thing I would definitely say, and I, that's why I'm so grateful to be here, one thing I have definitely learned in my short tenure and did not appreciate as a family doctor, even as a healthcare executive, was the impact of the advocacy work and having the right people in office. And I don't need to tell all of you, you're here because you're activated, but that is a huge, um, it's a huge, um, it's a very important to the work that we do on the healthcare side to have that advocacy, uh, excuse me, advocacy. So, um, we deliver health care across the Commonwealth. We have five health centers, um, large health centers, Boston, Springfield, and Worcester, and then two smaller health centers that just do family planning and preventive services in Marlboro and in Fitchburg. We have a large education department that delivers um, education across the country. Um, over a quarter of a million students uh, receive the curriculum that was designed here in Massachusetts. And a lot of the red states have the curriculum. There are about 30 states across the country. So Texas, Oklahoma, um, they are using uh, the Get Real curriculum. And I do want to remember to give a shout out to um, Representative Decker. She has been um, the lead sponsor of our Healthy Youth, uh, our Healthy Youth Act, which is um, our sex education uh, bill. Shamefully, in Massachusetts, it is now in its fourth legislative session. So one of the things that people are really surprised about, about when they, we talk about Planned Parenthood, is here in Massachusetts, there is no sex ed mandate. There is no expectation that schools will teach inclusive, age appropriate, medically accurate sex ed. And so, you know, there are lots of opportunities still in Massachusetts, not just in the healthcare delivery space, but also in, in the education space. And then um, lastly, we do um, a lot of advocacy work. And one of the things I do like to point out is our, a lot of our advocacy work is not specific to women's health. It's not specific to abortion access. Um, it's broad. We, we, we work very closely with a number of partners. And I'm very proud of the fact that we are part of a number of coalitions um, that are talking about things like confidentiality, about telemedicine, about ways to improve access to health care, and not just for sexual and reproductive health care, but for everything. So that's just in a nutshell. A lot of people are surprised that we do a lot of those things. The last thing we do, um, we do do some research. We're one of the few Planned Parent affiliates that does research, um, and we're affiliated with the Brigham. We've had published research on everything from um, some of the um, minor consent laws all the way to um, procedural improvements around delivery of, of services. So um, where are we now? Um, I'm going to just take a couple minutes and talk a little bit about the Planned, Parent, Planned Parenthood perspective of the ACA, and then hopefully we'll, we'll open it up. So the current situation is the repeal and whatever of the ACA is coupled with a defund of Planned Parenthood. And if you learn nothing but these two facts tonight, um, I would like you to leave with these two facts. Number one, there is no federal money that is used to pay for abortion. So I'll just repeat that. There is no federal money that is used for abortion. And that is one of the rallying cries of the extreme politicians who are really looking to defund Planned Parenthood. Um, the second, and, and personally for, for Speaker Ryan, my understanding is that is one of his key, um, key areas of focus. The second thing that's really important, and I hope you walk away, and I hope you talk to your friends and your neighbors about this, is what does defunding Planned Parenthood mean? So there is no line item in the budget, in the federal budget, in the state budget, that has a check coming to Planned Parenthood. The way we get paid through federal funds is we see a patient, we do a pap smear, we do an STI test, and we send a bill to MassHealth, if the patient has MassHealth. 
and then we get paid for the services that we provide to the patient. And then every quarter, the state connects with the federal government and they say, you know, we, we delivered this much amount of medical care to all of the mass health patients here in our state and, um, and, and pay us with the federal money. So we're in the bucket of providers who need to be paid through mass health, through fe some federal funds, just like every other healthcare facility. We provide care, we bill for the care, and we get paid. And that's how Planned Parenthood is funded. So there's, again, no line item in the budget. There's some misperception that, that people have that there's this big check um, that either has my name or Cecile Richards' name on it, um, and it somehow pays for everything in, in, uh, at Planned Parenthood. So we expect that this, this coupling of the repeal, the ACA, and defund Planned Parenthood, they are interwoven. And so um, my understanding, John may have a, a, a clear understanding of how this happens legislatively, but they, they, are, they are combined together. So we, we think that this will, not, not only just repealing the ACA, but, but defunding any services for Planned Parenthood will really institute a national health care crisis. We are at a 30-year low for teen pregnancy and for abortion rates. A 30-year low. <laughs> and the reason we are there is twofold. There's probably a couple more, but I think the two major reasons is number one, improved access. So the Medicaid expansion, ACA, I think in, in Massachusetts for sure, the Massachusetts uh, health care reform, that has clearly improved access for patients um, to health care services in general, but preventive sexual and reproductive health care in, in, in particular. The second thing that's really been groundbreaking is, the, is access to long-acting reversible contraceptives. So access to IUDs and to implantable hormones that are expensive up front, but overall extremely effective and very cost effective. A lot of them last for three to 10 years. There's a much higher effectiveness rate compared to even pills. And these are methods that previously, prior to the ACA, were only available with high copays or a high deductible. And so one of the really significant things, and again, I'm looking at it from our perspective, but given that women are a big part of the population and their families are an even bigger part of the population, I think it's legit. So, you know, the thing that really has made a difference is that the ACA has guaranteed no copay birth control. And why? Because someone figured out that family planning and birth control is actually a preventive service. Rather than just being a pharmacy right or a medication, a medical illness, actually thinking about family planning as preventive services. And so the idea that someone could come into the office, talk about the form of birth control that really fits for them, fits for their family, they get the right form of birth control right away without a copay is really critical. Now in my 20 years, I've seen people do all sorts of funky things with their medication. And certainly we, even with birth control. And when people are stressed, when they're strapped for cash, when they can't get to the pharmacy, when they can only get one pill pack at a time, they miss their pills. They cut them in half. They maybe don't even fill the prescription. They don't take it. And those are all things that are not the patient's problem, that's a problem with the system and a problem with access. And that is a huge advantage of what has happened for, for again, for women and families, a really huge improvement with, uh, with the Affordable Care Act. So I'll just, there's probably a lot more to talk about, but I want to take some, some of your questions. Um, what I would say is that, again, I think this intersection between the healthcare work and the advocacy work, the legislative work, is really critical. In fact, one of our um, our number one priority now is really what we ca we're calling the contraceptive access bill. And what we're hoping to do is um, codify um, the ACA requirements for birth control. In fact, take it a little step further, um, but um, have those, that same protection for family planning um, here in Massachusetts. And so we're at least hoping to, to have a counter action. The one other thing I would just point out, um, sorry, one other thing. You know, um, and this is the one that really blows my mind. So all of the talk about, about 
the ACA and repealing, you know, rolling back access with the repealing the ACA and defunding Planned Parenthood. You know, this is all an attack, not on abortion access, because that's protected in our state and it's protected in a number of other states. This is really about turning back the access for family planning. So those 30 year lows of teen pregnancy, those 30 year lows of abortion rates, they're gonna go up. And I think that's a shameful and criminal legacy for Speaker Ryan and the rest of the folks in Washington who are, who are touting this to be, to be left with. So with that, I will stop. <laughs> I think you're just beginning. Um, I, I'm going to take questions, but I also just want to acknowledge, um, I want to thank our, um, our most recent appointee or our city manager here, uh, Louis de Pasquale, who is here and is his, is his role as a city manager. But I also think it's important to acknowledge that he has served on the Cambridge Health Alliance board for decades, chaired the budget and, and the finance committee of the Health Alliance. And I can tell you when I was in the city council and Dr. David Osler can confirm this. Um, I certainly was very engaged with the Cambridge Health Alliance and um, debating whether or not we were creating more access to health care for our community and, and trying to figure out how to expand that. And I just want to say that um, Louis, while he was the um, budget director of the city and I was at the council, was always so informed um, and so engaged and deeply emotionally involved in the conversations with me and trying to translate me to other people at the Health Alliance who didn't always understand why I was so passionate about this. Um, so we have a city manager who is so deeply committed and has a long history of working on issues around access to health care and, and understanding who, the, who our safety net hospital here um, serves. So I'm so thankful that you're here tonight and I know that part of why you were here is it is unclear what will happen to us um, at the state level and at the local level if this, um, the order that Trump has given to not, um, to allow certain agencies to not have to enforce necessarily all components of the ACA. And um, we have a city manager who's working really hard to make sure that he is paying attention to figure out where can we connect the dots and, and pick up the pieces when possible. So I wanna thank you for all your work. Um, at this time, I would uh, like to thank both of our speakers, but I'd really like to open this up for questions um, from, from all of you. I'm going to start here. I can see your, if I can see your name tag, I can see your name, but Lori and then Andy. Um, so given that you're a state representative and there's a lot of... Sure. Given that you're a state representative and there's a whole lot going on at the national level, you mentioned one potential state bill. What else can we do at the state level, especially given the funding complication? Um, so what I would say is that part of the follow-up we have with these meetings is to send out you and to send out an email to you sort of summarizing what's been said here. Part of what I will do is also with my um, staff and my interns put together, I think, a series of bills that I think um, reflect sort of where we can make deeper impacts, and I, I'll send that out to you. And then part of it is to stay engaged with your elected officials, right? So people will say to me, oh, Marjorie, I don't have to call you. Um, you know, you're on top of this. And, you know, somebody who has a question next is, is Andy Zucker, who has been very engaged um, in education, but more recently on issues around the environment. And in fact, it's that kind of engagement with me where he has persistently called and emailed, knowing that I care about the issue, but knowing that my attention is like in a thousand different places. And so having constituents who keep me laser focused on issues that are important to them, which ultimately are important to me, is, is so helpful. So I would say if I'm your rep, please don't take me for granted that I'm with you. I'm with you, but getting my attention and keeping my advocacy active um, is another next step of engagement. And so I would say continue doing that. And then I think part of it is as things unfold, we will see what else we can do. But coming here, getting to know each other, stay engaged. And I, at the end of this, we also will email you out. There's lots of opportunities to figure out how to impact other communities in Massachusetts and outside of Massachusetts. And I think we're going to all have to do that. As, as a quick follow-up, um, I, I have heard that we are only a couple of state representatives away from being able to be an officially pro-choice state which we're not on the like state level right now. What else is possible? Like, do you, I know that you're gonna send out a list of bills, but is there anything else you can say about what can be done at the state level in the event that everything goes badly? Or is that something you're gonna have to wait? Well, I, I think, you know, there's, there's no one answer to this, and I understand that that would be the easiest thing for all of us. It's coming to a forum, being educated, making it known to me and other elected officials and to your 
your social circle that you're engaged, you're paying attention and you're not going away, um, has far more of an impact than I think most of us even realize or appreciate. And um, it's going to be, this is dynamic. This is ongoing. We're, you, Lori, and I are going to have an ongoing relationship that we didn't have prior to tonight. Yep. So, but I think that that, your question, lots of people have that question, but I'm going to ask, did you want to add yeah. to that? I just want to, I just want to add to that. I do think, um, you know, I say to myself every day, thank goodness I live in Massachusetts. Um, yeah. Um, and a lot of that, you know, we do have, we have a super majority of supporters in the Senate and a majority of supporters in the House. Um, however, there are still districts that are um, markedly anti-choice, um, very far to the right on a number of issues. So again, I, I'm a little myopic, so you know that. But um, but I think you know if if there was nothing else that was made clear to me in uh, in November um, was the the importance of getting people out to vote, getting people willing to run for office. There are some districts where um, far right Republicans, and there's one in particular who every year puts or every session puts up a few bills that talk about um, about defunding Planned Parenthood. He runs unopposed. And so, you know, I don't want to get too crazy here, but, you know, y we could do something. We collectively, okay, so I have my elect, my, I have my, um, my, uh, my Planned Parenthood advocacy hat on. There you go. I'm not talking about the health care. But we could certainly, as, as a state, you know, here you are in Cambridge, but you probably know people in that district. And having people have, you know, the willingness to run for office. Um, and even start off at the city council and the school board. I mean, those things really matter. And so that's the one one thing I'd like to add. Yeah. Andy. Yes. So this is a good follow-up one-two here because I want to ask about out-of-state. I would first say uh, echo opinions that I think everybody holds, which is we're lucky to live in Massachusetts. We very much appreciate Marjorie Decker as our state rep that we have really some great people. But I, I think uh, it was uh, Dr. McDonough who done it was talked about out-of-state pressure and I wonder if you could expand a little bit about that. So some group, I don't even remember which one, said I should contact people in Pennsylvania and West Virginia and ask them to contact their senators Republican senators because they were maybe squishier than some others. So that would be one kind of response. Like which states and governors and senators are particularly uh, going to be prone to pressure? And the other is, I've now gone to two post offices in Cambridge. They are completely out of the self-stamped postcards. Um, my daughter-in-law in Pennsylvania said, oh yeah, um, Toomey's on speed dial but I can never get through to the office. So how and who would so, so how many of you are connected with or part of the Indivisible Network? Okay, so, so if you're not part of that, that is just an extraordinary network that's created very quickly after November 9th by about 20 former Democratic congressional staffers who remembered the Tea Party experience in 2009 and 10 and said, we need to c figure out a way to bottle that energy for um, the resistance now. So if you just go to indivisibleguide.com on the web, um, you will see uh, the things to understand are, you know, to have real influence, uh, members, elected officials, speaking as a former elected official, really only care about people who live in their districts or their states and nobody else. It's just kind of, that's just the way it goes for the most part. I guess unless they're big contributors or something like that. Um, but, but, but in terms of advocacy, that's where you focus. Um, never bother with an online petition. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, uh, written letter, phone call, uh, personal visit, whatever. And always better, more than one. Um, uh, elected officials are always more heightened and sensitive when they have the sense that it's not just one person, but there's a group, even if it's just two or three. And that's the basis of the guide. It is now a, it is now a, a place, the indivisible, where, where groups are getting together. There are about more than 4,000 indivisible groups around the country right now uh, in all 50 states, uh, including Massachusetts. Uh, it's a great way to get connected and get active. There's another site where um, communities can actually adopt a, uh, 
a, 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 a House district uh, or a Senate district in another state uh, where there's a very conservative person and, and work uh, and, and, and make a project of working with Democrats in that place to help them build up and have more support. So lots, lots of things to do. Um, uh, very important to mobilize. And, uh, and, and I, would, I would say the, the one-stop shopping, aside from you know, your, your, your democratic organization here in Cambridge and, and, and around, is, uh, is thinking about the indivisible as, as a really powerful way that people, this is where a lot of these town meeting mobilizations are coming. It's coming straight out of the indivisible plan. Thank you. I'm going to go over here, and then I'll come over here. Oh, Renee. Uh, there are a set of bills that I know you know about, because there's some of you, that were uh, put into the um, Massachusetts legislature for potential action. And one of them is um, an act establishing Medicare for all in Massachusetts. So I wonder um, if you could say something about that and how we could advocate for that um, and how it would possibly work or who's working on that. Yep. So this has been, you know, um, a bill that I have been supporting um, since I was elected, and I believe um, Alice also supported this. Did you support this? Yeah, of course you did. Um, I looked at everything Alice did and knew I had to sign off. Um, no, um, I actually strongly believe in it. Um, it's been filed in the House and in the Senate. I would say the last couple of years, I probably was pretty pessimistic about its chances of passing. Um, would I tell you today that I think it's going to pass right away? I don't. What I do think, though, and I'd be curious to hear more of what you think, <laughs> um, I do think the opportunity to use that as a conversation about how to move forward in a time of uncertainty around health care, I think it's getting, it, I already have seen it get far more attention from people who didn't take it seriously and are taking it more seriously now, political people, elected people, um, because of the fear of losing um, the ACA, Obamacare, whatever we want to call it, the fear of losing coverage to affordable um, health care. So there are incredible groups like Healthcare for All and, and other groups that have been working on this. Um, but I would say that, um, again, I think everybody in the Cambridge delegation has signed on to this. If you have um, friends who live in other districts, getting, you know, if you can get one of them to get two of their friends, and, 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 and like John said, having three to five people contact a legislator, that's actually, and this was true when I was a legislative aide over 20 years ago, having three to five people make a phone call on one issue is still something that has an imprint on a legislator. Um, we're not getting three to five people. Um, I will tell you, uh, many of you will click the button when you are when you belong to these great advocacy groups, which is important, I don't want to say that it's not. Two things are true, though. When you do that, we don't actually get your email. So I, as a legislator, do not get your email. I get the email of the organization you joined. I'm not paying as close attention to that email as I am when I get the email from you in your email. Um, that just, it just is, because I can get 150 emails in a matter of 10 minutes. And what that means is now I'm trying to figure out how to, how, and what we in my office do is try to find 150 of those people so we can either send you a mail, a, a letter in the mail. It's just a lot of time that's going into this. If I get 150 emails from 150 individuals, even if it's the same letter, it's just, it's having a larger imprint on me. Um, so I would say click the button and then maybe also CC me with your own email. Um, but if you have friends in other communities, get them writing to their legislators about this. Writing phone calling and showing up. Those three things that one does not have more over the other. If you're going to visit a legislator or ask your friends to, I would say, if possible, getting to do that in the district. For those of you who've come to the State House and some of you here have, you know how quickly I can be pulled out of a meeting with you or I can actually even miss that meeting because there's so much going on at the State House and I don't always have full control of my schedule when I'm there. So getting me in Cambridge is always, people think it's exciting to come to the State House, which it is, but you have more of my attention if in fact I'm meeting you here in Cambridge um, or outside of the State House. But I'm gonna turn this over to you. No, I'll pass. You pass? Okay. Hi. Um, I think this is great. Uh, my concern, the reason why I came here tonight, is that uh, a lot of like the elderly and people living in special housing are getting misinformation 
um, things like that. They're hearing things about death panels, which are uh, things, stories like that. They're you know clicking on chan right wing channels like that sound like Fox and getting misinformation from those and reacting to it. And they they just don't know where to turn to get the correct information. And I was wondering maybe if people could go to public housing and things, you know, those properties to get this kind of information. Out. So I think you, you're in a great new position as well, right? So Manny has just been appointed by the city to work on issues around um, immigration and, or uh, to, to, to be paying attention to immigrants in our community and to be a resource. And I think, again, one of the questions that you'll, you will all be able to ask each other is sort of what resources do you bring to the table? And I was at a, a Cambridge Foundation forum this morning that talked about income inequality, housing and education, specifically in Cambridge. Um, and if you have the chance, go to the Cambridge Foundation website. It's really important reading. But one of the things that they've been talking about is how to take this out to various community groups. Some of you, are, I know it has a new name, but when I was doing it, it was called Share the Wealth. Um, and I was in my early 20s and I remember being trained as a trainer to go into both low-income communities as well as high-income households and talk about what income inequality looks like. And I think, again, it's having a house party for Planned Parenthood doesn't have to just be at a house. It can be in a public housing development. It can be in a community space. Um, many of us have resources and knowledge to actually bring those or invite people, right? If you have a group of people you want to become more informed, reach out to me and other people that you know and say, would you, become, would you, would you come and be willing to speak to us? So I think that that's, we're going to be our best resources in, in pulling that information in a grassroots level together. Jenny. Um, this goes back to the question you were answering before. You said writing showing up and making a phone call. I just wanted to ask you, since you were providing your insight and your experience, if you could, um, if we could just um, unpack the writing piece, because in my imagination, a piece of um, personalized handwritten mail might have more impact than an email. So to me, that's two different types of writing, and I was curious if your, your, your perspective. I think personalized handwritten or typed out on and mailed in, um, email is so easy, you get so much volume um, I, I, that I, I would pay more attention to something mm -hmm. just, just in a threshold. Not a big difference, but I'd, I'd put a personalized letter above an email because emails are just so easy to send in. Um, something that requires a little bit more effort um, indicates a little bit more perhaps intentionality on mm -hmm. the part of the person who's sending it. Paper mail is a little tricky right now though because it has to get screened and that can be a six week at the, at the congressional level, yeah, not at the state level. What I would just say is I, I really think that's a tough question because we, we might disagree a little bit about that. I think an email that is personalized for me I'm going to pay more attention to than an email that is coming to me through a form letter. Um, a, a handwritten letter versus an email, I'm going to get back to that person by email faster than I am by snail mail. But that just depends on who the legislator is and who the district is as well. So I think that the most important thing that you can do is um, find the most efficient way for you to contact your legislator, then if you can personalize that, however, whether it's snail mail or email, even better. And then if you can find a way to connect with that legislator by phone um, or in person. And, and I'll tell you something, people will call the office all the time and they won't leave me their number back to call. They just want to make note. Um, call your legislator and say, I'd like to actually speak to the legislator. Um, it might take a couple of days. I. I could spend all day being from Cambridge. My staff and I could spend all day responding to emails and still not get through them all and then have no time for work. That's, that's how much my crying and my whining to the speaker has been, I'm from Cambridge, I need more staff. Um, and he understands and hasn't given it to me yet, but um, he agrees. But so I'm just saying, I think it has to be whatever the most efficient thing is and however you can personalize it is, ha is, is important. And if you don't mind to say, I just want to say thank you to you because Jenny is also, can I say, Jenny the juggler who also brings joy. And right now I think um, it is so important that we find ways to continue to have joy and build community. And I know that you do that in your work. So I have known you from afar and you have known me from afar, um, but I want to thank you. <laughs> All the way in the back. Hi. Um, is Governor Baker advocating at all for Planned Parenthood? <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great question. Um, so I actually met with the governor yesterday, and um, I would say um, 
you know, and I've met with the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Secretary Sutters, I met with the Director of, of um, Mass Health, Dan Tsai, I mean, we're definitely working it. Um, and what I would say is that um, I think, I do think that Massachusetts is different. Massachusetts has been a leader. Massachusetts leaders have stood up for the right thing, you know, access to health care. Um, you know, they have stood up for, for Planned Parenthood and for access to women's health. Um, what I would say is that I am very cautiously optimistic. Um, I think that for most folks in this room, you'll understand. I don't think anyone wants to go on record saying anything um, before anything happens. And um, and I, you know, I, I, I think that that makes, um, that, that might make sense. Um, the Connecticut governor um, down uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago um, did make a public statement um, about, about Planned Parenthood specifically. Um, he's a Democratic governor um, in a Democratic state and the Planned Parenthood in southern New England takes care of all of the family planning services for the state. So there's a huge, um, a huge um, impetus to do that. So I'm not trying to dodge your question. Um, what I would say, though, is that um, there's been um, a lot of really good conversations. I have felt that um, we at Planned Parenthood and in the greater family planning um, collaborative, so it's not just about us. I mean, I think, you know, we, you know, we're, we're out there, but, um, but overall the support for family planning and the specific support for, for Planned Parenthood has been um, very positive uh, on Beacon Hill, and I'm really, really grateful for that. And I'm so appreciative because, it, you know, that's, it's really about the, com the you know, the, the folks who live in the Commonwealth, and it's, it's r the right thing to do, so. I'm going to add one note to that, okay. and I think it's, again, this goes back to how important I think that it is that you are in your position, um, and I think that your ability to have conversations with legislators um, throughout the state, both uh, those who represent more conservative districts who are Democrats and Republicans who are more conservative, um, I think we need Governor Baker, I will say, I need him to be a lot more visible in his support. And he just cut from his budget $900,000 almost from family planning. So whether he supports Planned Parenthood or not, in House One budget, which just came out, House One refers to the governor's budget in the first year of a two-year cycle, he cut almost $900,000 from family planning. At a time in which we know nationally we are very worried about reimbursements for all of our family planning care, um, but in particular for Planned Parenthood. So I'm not impressed at the moment. Um, I do hope that um, the incredible competency of Jen and the Planned Parenthood staff and all of those others, co there's a huge coalition of people working on family planning hood, will have those conversations that help them understand why that is actually devastating. So I, I want to see him actually support greater access to health care, not take away from it. Uh, here in the here. So just from this room, should we all like get out our pens as soon as we get home and give the governor a little message from Cambridge? I, I think you could call his office tomorrow and, and ask why did he cut $900,000 from, from, for family planning. And then you could also ask, um, there'll be a time in the budget cycle in which the House and the Senate work out their budgets and I hope that we put it back in and you can ask him not to veto it. Um, some of you, I just want to be clear, some of you, oh, Marianne, do you want to add to this? I was just going to say that, um, I, 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 I sort of asked you a question too. Um, is the speaker going to, oh, I'm sorry, uh, it, does the speaker have plans to override some of the nine seat cuts that happened even? I was just going there. So I wanted, so I have, some of you have emailed me and said, you know, please reverse the governor's nine C cuts. As you know, Marianne, uh, we can't reverse the governor's nine C cuts. So we had a budget last year, and we, the House and the Senate put together a budget that we believed was fiscally responsible. The governor came in and said, this is not what I think, this is not the, the budget that we can afford, and he cut a whole bunch of programs. Well, the House and the Senate got together and had enough votes to say, no, you're still wrong, governor. We do have the resources to support this budget, and we overrode them. What he did then at the 11th hour was then he did what's called a 9C cut where the governor can go in and with one swoop of the pen he can actually cut funding from the budget and we can't reverse them. What we can do is have a supplemental budget. So here is the dynamic between the governor 
and the Democratic House and Senate, right? Republican governor, Democratic House and Senate. The Democratic House and Senate, which I think spans the, the political dynamics from a very conservative to a very progressive, collectively said, we have the resources to support this budget. The governor, however, said, oh, we don't have the resources. But what you should note is that he did not cut across the state. The majority of the cuts that, were, that, that he made were to districts represented by Democrats. So if you were a Republican, you probably did not see your local cuts. So in Cambridge, I was able to get $115,000 for the weekend backpack project, which meant that we went from being able to provide six schools um, with food for children on the weekends to all of our school, elementary schools. He cut that, but he did not cut other local programs and other communities that were represented by Republican legislators. So um, th it, his argument doesn't hold sway. And so there'll be a process in this, but there'll be a time in this budget process where we, the, um, s we are looking to hopefully do a supplemental budget that will restore some of that. As you know, it gets tricky because at this point, it's not a full restoration because time has already gone by where those programs didn't, they've already lost the resources and the money. Um, and as we're looking at sort of, I I'll tell you, it doesn't, the, the erratic nature of our federal government right now and the neutrality of our governor does not make, does not build confidence in, I believe, in the House and Senate leadership to do a supplemental budget um, for programs that have already now experienced the cuts without understanding what the future holds, the, the short future holds for us economically and what the revenues coming in from our, our taxes are. But I do think it's important to note that both the House and the Senate leadership collectively twice said, we have the resources to sustain this budget. This governor politically went in and cut programs that Democratic legislators had funded. So there'll be a time in which you can call tomorrow and ask for an explanation of why did you make some 9C cuts and not all? Or you can call and you can call and say, um, why did you cut almost a million dollars from family planning and how do you expect those programs to actually do that kind of work? And then there'll be in the time when the House and the Senate do put that money into the budget and you can say, I certainly hope you won't veto this. Um, so th those are some of the ways. I, I just want to mention in terms of the, uh, the question about who to call in other states, um, Healthcare for All and Greater Boston Interfaith and a whole you know, coalition of groups are uh, organizing a friends and family campaign. So if you go on to Healthcare for All, uh, Massachusetts website and just put in friends and family it lists all the states that you can call your friends or relatives to call their uh, senators and then um, also there's a lot of important legislation that you can find on healthcare for all site as well around reducing the cost of care improving dental ex uh, coverage in Medicaid and expanding dental care in general and on children's mental health so another a, no a number of important bills at the state level um, that are really worth uh, working on as well. I just want to put a plug in for another <clears throat> activism organization. It's called Swing Left. Have a lot of you heard of that? So that's where that enables you to pick up a buddy district in another area where there's, they have a vulnerable house seat. So for me in Cambridge is NH2. So there is a woman there, when she comes up in 2018, <clears throat> she had a very close election. And we know from the experience in New Hampshire that a lot of those margins were very, very tight. And so our support really matters. But if you have friends or family in other districts, you can put in those zip codes, find out who's in that area, and then be able to provide your support. But they are really working, particularly in the house. But it's super easy. All you do is go to swing left, Put in your zip code and they tell you who your buddy district could be that you could support and they'll be in touch with you. Mm -hmm. so. I say thank you to Fran Cronin, who's a former school committee member and maybe potentially another one again. <laughs> so thank you for that. You. Um, if you haven't had a question, I'm going to take you. So, And then I'll try to come back. Uh, so worst case scenario, Massachusetts loses a lot of federal revenue. Could Massachusetts make that up with increased taxes or magic? <laughs> yes, but it's a lot. Yes. It's an awful lot and it would be a large tax increase and it would be quite politically challenging to replace the entire thing just from my experience. Um, so that's why this fight is so important for Massachusetts as well. Um, on the order of how large? Do you know? Um, I, I, 
So uh, you know, we just got a uh, we just got a federal waiver uh, the two couple of days before the November election that over five years is worth about six billion dollars. <laughs> so you know, we're we're talking um, large numbers here, and that's just a that's just one element of, of it. It's, it's a it's a it's a very large part of the state budget. It's about forty percent of the state budget. Most of that is federal, but uh, so. Uh, uh, covering that is is going to be a, a, would be a major political challenge, um, and uh, it would be hard to avoid some uh, real real significant harm. Anyone who hasn't asked a question, you might have one. Uh, everyone's talking about health care, but why? It seems no one's talking about uh, health. You know, the standard American diet is one of the least healthy in the world. We pay twice as much as all these other countries for health care. But the results are, are not good. Uh, it's mostly animal food. There's lots of chemicals in the food. People are busy in our car restaurants. The whole thing. Uh, and you know, Dr. Mercola on his website explains all this and how to deal with it. Why is it not being talked about? I, I think it's being talked about in some circles, not in enough circles. And I think that goes back to, you know, how are we doing preventative work, right? How do we make it so that what we are inhaling and breathing and touching and eating isn't making us sicker. Um, and I, I would say thank you for raising it, and we need to keep talking about it. Um, I will say there, there is a tax out there someone filed on, um, what do they call it, the, the junk food tax? The, I forget what it is. But trying to tax foods that we know, there, there's a whole other political dynamic around sort of whether that's also regressive. Um, so I, I think there are conversations in it, and it's complicated. Um, and we also, I will just say, we have allowed a lot of our junk food industries to become deeply unregulated during the Reagan years in ways that which they can influence um, family and in particular children's eating habits and how they tie it to marketing and toys um, in ways other countries don't allow them to. Um, and so that's for a much larger conversation. But we, we, we did have a way of addressing some of that and we did regulate it and then we um, lost all of that and we haven't found our way back to it, but other countries um, have taken that on in a way that we haven't yet again. Yes, please. So, so it seems that one of the more exciting things going on in that arena is uh, cities around the country who are passing taxes on soda, on sugar sweetened beverages, and winning, and taking on the soda industry. Uh, it actually started down in Mexico about four or five years ago, where they passed a national tax on soda, and it had a major effort uh, to defeat it by Coca-Cola and the other big uh, lobbies, and um, they lost, and, and the tax went in, and it's already had uh, demonstrated major health improvement impacts in Mexico. And so now we are seeing, not so much at a state level yet, but in big cities. Philadelphia was the uh, most recent one that had a major tax increase, and, and they used the money to support education and schools, and, uh, and they won. And so I, I, this is, if, if you want it's, to, it's starting to feel a little bit like the uh, tobacco industry in the 1990s, uh, where the uh, industry is losing their political power to hold back uh, the will of the people. It'll be interesting to see. We haven't really seen it tackled yet in Massachusetts, municipally, or at the state level, but uh, I think this is a really ripe and promising area going forward that absolutely has important beneficial health impacts if you're able to succeed. And I think it's also interesting to note that um, the, re the revelation around the sugar industry's role in um, funding research at Harvard to produce outcomes that showed um, the, the contradiction to, to show, in fact, um, that sugar was not harmful when, in fact, the sugar industry and those researchers in knew that sugar was harmful and addictive. Um, so I, I think that. There is a lot out there to be talked to talk about. Um, I think it's important that people talk about it because I don't think that elected officials um, feel the confidence um, or the courage to be leading the way always. I know that I was proudly ridiculed at Bartley's Burgers, and I think they still have a thing named after me. It was very unflattering. Um, and so I've, re I've refused to go in there, so my kids have never had Bartley's Burgers. Um, and uh, because I had suggested as a city councilor that we take note of what they were trying to do in New York under Bloomberg, and that was to ban supersized sodas. Um, and again, it was you know just my it was dipping my toes in, in trying to address the issue. Um, but it is a big issue. It is an important issue, and I think that we will only see more action on this politically um, if 
the grassroots actually demands their elected officials talk more about it. Um, is there someone else? Oh, Alice. Uh, I'd like to follow up on the comment about uh, the fact that in Massachusetts we do not have a law regarding sex education. Uh, when I was in the legislature, I was the chief sponsor for quite a number of terms around comprehensive health education. And, we, and of course, everyone said, well, you're just trying to clothe the sex education into making this comprehensive health education, which was partially true. <laughs> but the fact is, we are talking about pre preventative health care, lots of money that goes into it and stuff. And one of the things that we could do um, that would be very effective and preventative is to have our young people be well educated about a whole uh, uh, panoply of uh, education issues, including sex education. I remember, for example, a, uh, a student from Newton who came to testify about this comprehensive health uh, care bill and said, you know, we, we now have this comprehensive health education, which they, they assume they still have. And one of the things that we learned was about all the symptoms of depression. And that helped us so much to be able to support some of our friends who were really having issues around depression. So I think as a preventative health measure, that would, I'd like to see us go back to that. And, of course, sneak in the sex education. <laughs> and I'll just say, Alice makes an important point because the bill that I have been credited as filing is actually the bill that I, I picked up and continued to file um, from Alice. And there's an important, something important to note here. The bill that I'm filing um, and carrying the water from when Alice filed it, ours would mandate comprehensive health education. We can't even get the bill right now that would allow communities to opt in to the curriculum. So the one that gets, the one that you hear about and the one that you're asked to write about um, is one that is um, Representative um, Pink Sox, no, Worcester. He always wears colorful socks. This, he, um, he, yeah, Representative O'Day, who's a former social worker um, and a state rep and he wears colorful socks. Um, he files the bill, uh, the, the Healthy Youth um, Bill, that actually would allow communities to opt in using the curriculum, and we can't get that passed. So um, just to give you a sense of where we're at. I think we're going to take one or two more questions, and then I'm going to thank both of our guests, and if there's anything else they would like to add. And then if you can, I'd love for you to consider staying. And we had, it was a really powerful conversation for those of you who were able to stay last time, where you actually talked to each other. We asked someone to take notes. Um, and then someone to report back. It's about a 20 minute conversation. And then I gather all of that. I'll take your notes physically, but we'll also record what you're saying as you report back to us as a community. Um, because a part of this is taking um, informed and accurate information and ideas, but then also turning to each other to be um, resources and building community, which I continue to think is our best hope at taking on um, what we're facing right now. So I'll take one or two more questions for anyone who hasn't asked a question yet. Okay, so right here and right here. So reproductive health has been singled out as a particular part of health care to be affected. I'm wondering about uh, the effect on people with disabilities and mental health coverage. Mm -hmm. um, so, so people don't appreciate it, but the Affordable Care Act is one of the most important laws that's ever been passed regarding behavioral health, which is mental health and substance abuse. A uh, guaranteed issue and eliminating pre-existing conditions means you can't be denied coverage because you have or had mental illness or substance abuse disorder. Uh, the ban on lifetime and annual coverage limits means that if you have a very expensive hospitalization, um, you can't run up and run out the money and then told you have no longer coverage. Uh, Title I of the ACA lists 10 essential health benefits that must be included in all health insurance policies uh, across the nation, or most of them. Uh, and one of the essential health benefits is behavioral health, treatment for mental health and substance abuse. So the potential and, and essential health benefits is very much on the agenda for the House leadership and the Republican leadership 
to get rid of and say let's just turn it back to the states and the mental health community nationally is deeply concerned about seeing an enormous step backward in terms of where we've come over the past couple of years because of the changes and it's also what goes into other things so if you think of for example people with cancer or people who in the next couple of years are going to get cancer because there's always new cases that are coming a guaranteed issue a lifetime and annual benefit limits uh, the essential health benefits for things like prescription drugs um, there's a requirement in the ACA that says you must have coverage if you're participating in a clinical trial uh, never it was always a problem insurance companies would not cover people in clinical trials they're now required to by law because of the ACA all of that is at risk uh, and, and plus taking coverage away from people who are in the middle of cancer treatment um, is very much a threat so if you just sort of think about the the damage that is uh, that is uh, very very possible right now in terms of uh, in terms of the kinds of things that are being discussed down in DC so you just can't you can't under under emphasize under emphasize the human importance of what's at stake here Thank you. oh I'm sorry uh, everything that I said about mental health and substance abuse everything I said about cancer absolutely applies in terms of the disability community so and 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 uh, all of the things in terms of guaranteed issue lifetime benefit limits essential health benefits all of those things absolutely apply to people who are uh, who are on disability in one way or another and so absolutely it's all it's, it's all diabetics asthmatics every, everybody with any kind of a chronic health condition that they have to endure is very much at risk in terms of what's going on right now in DC and if we can do this quickly, I'll take both of your questions. So, starting with you. Okay. All right. Um, so, my name is Ryan Joy O'Connor. I'm actually, to be completely honest, from Brookline. Um, so, <laughs> okay. So, 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 put it all out there. Um, but I think I have a um, vested interest in um, healthcare, um, ACA, um, healthcare policy. So, we've spoken a lot of tonight about how detrimental this would be if the, the ACA is repealed. Um, we haven't really spoken about what is the actual plan. We have action items for Massachusetts if the ACA is repealed. And then as kind of a, as kind of a follow up, um, are there any merits to gaining patient involvement in policy changes? And you know, as we all know, the president said um, that healthcare is incredibly complex, and who, who knew that? Um, so how, how can we um, engage more in, um, in the intricacies and the complexities of health care policy. So I, I just very, just, just quickly, um, thank you for the question. So um, there, there is already a state coalition that's formed very quickly after November 8th called the Mass Coalition for Coverage and Care that was started by Healthcare for All and the Blue Cross Foundation of Massachusetts. It's got about 120 organizations that are already a part of it. That are, uh, that are working, uh, large organizations, small organizations, all over the healthcare space, that, are, that, is, that is learning as much as they can about what is at risk, what is at stake in terms of it, doing an analysis of the current statutes and the current law, and readying for what may come. But there's so much uncertainty about what may come. So the, you know, they, there's very much, Medicaid is very much, has a target on its back, but will it be a block grant? Will it be a per capita cap? Will it be none of the above and you know, rescinding the expansion? Or none of that is, is all highly uncertain. And, and so no one knows. And so to go too deep down a road when there's so many hypotheticals at this point just doesn't make sense. The other thing I would say is that you know, every patient is, a, is also a healthcare consumer. Every healthcare consumer is a voter. Every voter is a citizen. Um, and so, so it is really, so the imperative for patients, I mean, is just so strong in these town meetings when it is, uh, it, is in, it, is, it is people who have been personally helped by the ACA who stand up, the woman who stood up to Senator Cotton in Arkansas and, uh, and said, you know, three members of my family, including me, would be dead were it not for the Affordable Care Act. 
And these stories are true. I mean, these, these are not made up. And, and by the way, people say, who are the Republicans to target? All of them. All of them. I mean, there, there are, every one of them needs to feel the heat and the pressure and the stories from their own constituents about what's at stake for people they are sworn to represent. Thank you for your questions. And we welcome everyone here in Cambridge. You had a question. I think this is the last one. Jake McKinney, I'm a resident uh, physician at CHA, and some of the colleagues are here. So kind of along community building, um, something we've founded over there, the Social Justice Coalition, and a lot of physicians, people from all different professions have gotten together and are trying to address some of these things that have been going out, protecting our patient population here. Um, and I'm a transplant from Tennessee, so there's a lot of different conversations happening down there, and I'm, I'm thankful to be here at this time. Yeah, but boy, your senators matter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. Um, but so, one thing that we've been working on a lot is, you know, we've talked amongst ourselves what we want to do, but community building and other organizations talk about it, indivisible as being a nationwide thing. What do you see in this community as being a hub where should all these small community groups who are within this one healthcare organization or other community <coughs> groups, where is our local elected representatives? Should they be the hub? Is that who they should be? So I don't know if I have an exact answer for that. First, I'm going to say I'm so thankful that you and your colleagues are here. So I've been in local office for almost 20 years. So it's hard to believe. And one of the things, I, and I've gotten my care uh, with the exception of a couple of years since I was born at the Cambridge, what was the city hospital and is now the Cambridge Health Alliance. I can't think of a place that better serves the health care needs of my family or our community, right? Um, you don't know how much money I have or don't have or any of your patients for the most part unless it becomes obvious and, or you ask and the care is just as great. Um, I also want to say that I would go into the Health Alliance um, over the years and I would say, routine checkup for whatever it was, do you vote? And I would just ask the physician or the resident, do you vote? If I was in the ER, do you vote? And uh, they, they would be shocked. And because one of the things I had heard early on 20 years ago was that doctors are not some of the highest voting people, population. And I would say, wow, you don't, and, and I would get an answer, you don't vote. And I would say, you do realize that even here as a city councilor, I'm making choices about how to use resources that impact your ability to serve your patients. Um, and so you need to vote, right? If you feel like you need to do more for your patients, then you need to make sure the people who have the ability to help you do that are actually the people you want making those choices. So I will just say that. Thank you for um, all of the work that you are doing and will do um, and tying it into where we are today politically. Um, as far as a group's concerned, I, I, I'm going to turn that over a little bit to you. I think there's a lot of different places that you can think about turning to. Um, one of the things that I'm really grateful for is I have had the chance to work with pediatricians um, in a number of ways, but one of the ways that people might not make the connection to is I have filed, this is my second term filing, the earned income tax credit um, bill, which would increase that earned, in, earned income tax credit up to 50%. Um, where there's a handful of communities, um, states and communities around the country that have done that, and some, um, a lot that are higher than Massachusetts, but 50% is the maximum of what I found, so I thought, if somebody else can do it 50%, so can Massachusetts. And I've been working with the Children's Health Watch, which was founded by a, a doctor, and um, working with pediatricians to say, how do we use pediatricians to create a narrative about understanding that when families have more money in their pockets, they actually are able to take better care of their families and therefore have better health outcomes. And it has been really powerful to advocate for this tax credit with pediatricians. Um, and it just, at first they thought, well, maybe we should make this a housing issue. And I said, no, because that tax credit is really not going to make a dent truthfully in being able to ha allow people to access more affordable housing. But it does make a difference in your ability to buy diapers. It does make a difference in your ability to buy um, various things that your infant needs or to pay your heat for one month or to buy a few more extra groceries each week. That, those are the things that do. So I just want to say, I think that wherever you plug in, um, that the medical community has such an important voice um, in understanding that the needs of your patients, right, are, are impacted, their, their health, outcome, health, health outcomes are impacted in so many ways and in so many silos. So I'm gonna turn to John and ask maybe for more specific guidance or even to Jen, um, but I will just say that you have a powerful voice that can go a lot of different ways. Um, and when you collectively come together to advocate them, um, it makes a real impact because it's such a 
different voice than what we hear on issues that might people might not associate you with. So I, I would just say this is an issue for the nation. This is a national issue. This is an issue uh, that addresses American society, which is why we're seeing people raise their voices all over the country. And so whatever way um, helps you to influence and raise a voice that is heard on Capitol Hill is most vitally important. Um, and then what you want to do, how you would organize here, I think depends upon what are the what are the things that you would like to impact and be most affected by. You can work with um, uh, statewide consumer groups like Healthcare for All. You can work through the local Democratic Party here. You can work. There's there's so many ways. It's really kind of it's what what is what is your highest priority because it's a big space. I mean, you've got activists working on women's uh, health issues through. Planned Parenthood and other things, and so it's. I, I, I guess it's a little bit more. I need to know a little bit more about, you know, what what what's your highest priority that you want to try to be effective on. So, maybe, sorry, as a follow-up, just specific to ACA reform, because we've got some yeah, kind of different things of immigrant refugee rights, for example. But for ACA reform in particular, I guess it right. It's who knows what's to come. There's so much to be seen. But why don't we talk after? Sure. <laughs> I would just um, add to what um, John and, and Rep Decker have said. Um, people don't expect to hear from physicians. You know, they know you're busy, you're you know, off doing that doctor stuff. So, you know, what I have found um, in my role now is being able to tell the patient stories, you know, talk about what it was, you know, like as a primary care physician, tell the stories about women who, you know, couldn't get the birth control they needed, had to flunk out of different options and, and got pregnant because, you know, they had a bad choice. So uh, a birth control option. So, I mean, all of those things are really powerful. So I agree um, with, with John is, you know, pick your you know, find what you're passionate about and then connect with an organization. And, you know, I'll just speak for us, but, you know, we can easily find things for people to do. There are often hearings, there are, you know, and, and, and matching people with their interests is really, when you tell that authentic story that you're really passionate about, that's what really makes a difference. And, and don't ever underestimate the impact of being a, a, a clinician, a healthcare provider. I'm just gonna tell a very quick story around a physician who visited me several weeks ago um, and understanding the impact of what is happening like it's it's not just that we're waiting for um, harm to occur to people under this president it's already happening so there is a woman who is here and she's undocumented and she has five children and she's in a very unsafe violent relationship and she's now pregnant with her sixth child and um, or so she's now pregnant and in fact decides she wants to terminate that pregnancy for her health and the health of her family. Um, they are trying to figure out how to get her to the hospital. And it's unsafe for her to have her partner know that she is trying to leave the house. Um, Trump, the week that he signs this executive order, um, which is banning Muslims from this country, um, immediately the uh, abusive um, partner starts holding this over her head as a way of continuing to um, to, invict, to inflict more um, violence on her. And um, they're, so they're trying to, so this physician is trying to work with her in a way that is safe for her to get the phone call and trying to find a safe, a safe way for her to take care of her health needs and get out of there. But now because of this um, executive order, um, and the, the partner is using this more um, to intimidate her. Um, she can't get out. She finally, finally makes it to um, meet the physician, and it's too late. It's too late for her to now have control over her reproductive rights and her family planning and the health of her children. And um, for me, having that physician come to lobby me was so powerful that this person took time out of their, what we do perceive are incredibly overtaxing schedules for many of our doctors um, who are forced to, to see a lot of patients with not enough time. Um, to have that person come and tell that story and to be able to use this story in a way that now helps other people in, in my political world understand the damage that's already being done. Because there's some people who are still saying, well, it hasn't happened yet. But it has happened, and people's lives are being damaged, and people are losing their life, and they're losing their health, 
and they are impacting their ability to keep their families and themselves safe. And people are actually using it as abusive tools to continue to hurt people. So I just want to say to all of you here today that um, like all of you, I am in some ways I'm unraveled by what is happening in our country. Um, I'm also really empowered by um, the resistance that is occurring because what I know and what many of you know is that the uh, damage that is being done under this presidency and the threatening of people's safety and livelihood was happening long before this person became president. There are many people in our community and throughout this country whose lives have been in danger, threatened, and have lost their lives because of the inequity, because of racism, um, and because of poverty and injustice. And now there's a wake-up call to more of us to the urgency of that if we weren't experiencing that prior um, or on a day-to-day -day basis. And the urgency of all of us coming together and saying we actually, it's not just enough to maybe go cast a vote and hope that my elected official does their best. Um, it's in fact upon all of us to connect with each other. Really, and I, I, I just really, what's the answer? The answer is each other. Um, the answer is in getting to know people we don't know. So before you leave tonight, um, if you have the opportunity to just meet one to three people that you don't know, I think getting to know each other and personalizing who we are to one another as a community makes us more accountable to each other. Um, and, and finding ways to dig deeper. I'm not going home and figuring out how to get out of bed every day. There's too many people who had to get out, who have to get out of bed every day prior to this president being elected and just getting out of bed and just getting their kids to school and just keeping a roof over their head or getting their families to a shelter or staying alive, spending the night in the emergency room because they had no emergency shelter. They have had the tenacity and the endurance that the rest of us now are gonna experience in some ways. And so I'm not, um, going to fall into a hole of depression. I am inspired and determined. All of you inspire me in this community. I hope we find inspiration and strength in one another. Um, and we will continue to make sure that the progress has been made and the progress that needs to be made, um, it moves forward because not having it move forward is not an option. Um, and there have been many people who have gone on to just live an extra day because of the strength they've had inside. Um, so with that, I would say thank you both to John and to Jen, and I would ask you all to please join me in thanking them. I, yes, I also want to say that um, Jen has here um, very concrete ways that suggest ways that you can help to ensure um, access to health care and family planning um, and support of Planned Parenthood. So I'm going to pass these around. I'm going to ask, we are going to be out of here by 7.30. If you could actually take a few minutes right now um, and turn to each other, and if you would be willing to do this, this is like a, a rapid response here, a lightning round, we're going to call it. I have some questions up here. What questions do you still have? And hopefully you will find a recorder in your group. What questions do you still have after these conversations tonight? What free resources do you bring to each other? Are you part of an organization? Are you part of a network? Do you not feel like you're part of a community that can actually help you advocate? Would you like to be part of one? And what are the next steps that you're most excited about taking? Questions are up here. We'll walk around. I'm going to ask you to record those. If we have time, we'll do a report back. Otherwise, I'll ask you to hand them to me. This is Laura Booth. I have Paul Fahey over here and some interns. They will be walking around to help collect some of this. Thank you, everybody.